Welcome everyone to Body Ecology Living. This podcast is really an important one. First of all, there are hundreds of millions of long haulers in the world and there's the practitioners that they're going to, whether it's a Western medicine practitioner or functional medicine practitioner, they're, you know, they're, they're mystified basically, um, if that's a word, but they're confused and they don't know how to help people. But my guest today, Dr. Leo Gallen does know how to help people. He has, uh, his website is drgallon.com and on there he has a coronavirus handbook. He really has dug deeply into what's going on with people with long COVID. So this entire podcast, we go into the different things that are happening in the body of someone with long COVID. Um, you'll have to stay to the end until you hear what he thinks about the future. Is this long COVID going to be around for a long time? Um, what kind of damage has it uh, has occurred in the body that's going to affect us? years to come, maybe even affect our DNA and change our genes perhaps. But we talk about the mitochondria, we talk about gut health, we talk about viral persistence, and a lot about this ACE2 receptor, which most people think is how the virus just gets into the cell. They don't realize that as the virus gets into the cell, it damages this ACE2. And that that's doorway basically has extremely important functions all over the body in the brain and the lungs and the gut, large and small intestine and the kidneys and the testes. So we, you need to know about the ACE2 receptor. So I'm very grateful for Dr. Gallen to do this. We did it late at night uh, after he had a long day of work and it's just an amazing podcast. So I hope you enjoy. By the way, if you are enjoying this, please subscribe to our channel and uh, send in, a, you know, you can write to us and by email and just tell us what you would like to hear. So thank you. Welcome, Dr. Gallen. Hi, Donna. Good to be with you today. Well, <laughs> I'm all prepared, so hopefully it'll go well. Um, okay, so I just want everybody to know that functional medicine, in your case in particular, you are always searching for the root causes. Like, why does somebody have this condition? And what you, is unique about this person's illness? You treat every pet patient and every illness um, as unique. That's what makes a functional medicine doctor. And there's just not enough of them in the world. Um, so when COVID came along and you, can you just sort of tell us how you, what you started doing, like how you started jumping into it and researching it and and where it led you, all this. Well, in January of 2020, I realized um, I, my patients are going to have a lot of questions about this. And I really wanted to be able to give them answers because I wasn't going to rely on what the CDC had to say. And so I started reading about the SARS um, epidemic that had occurred 20 years earlier, almost 20 years earlier, um, and the MERS um, epidemic. So I could understand what was happening with the biology of these, um, of these kind of devastating coronaviruses, which are so different in the way they affect people than the more common coronaviruses, which cause like the common cold, for example. And um, by March, I had already formulated a concept of these are the things that are going on and these are the things that we can do to help people protect themselves when they're exposed, if they get infected. And so I started putting a protocol together. Uh, it was based upon uh, my understanding, which started with the SARS research, that when the body, when this virus enters your cells, it uses a receptor called ACE2. And my original thought was, oh, let's find a way to block ACE2. Then I realized, no, that's not a good idea because ACE2 is a vitally important enzyme. And a lot of the damage that's done happens because this enzyme gets destroyed in the course of the infection. So I started out from the perspective of we need to support ACE2 and to help people recover from this. I actually think that was the right perspective because very, very few of the hundreds of patients that I've treated who had COVID-19 um, went on to develop long COVID, I'd say under 1%. Whereas 
uh, you know, I mean, the numbers uh, range anywhere from about 10 to 50 percent in the studies that have been done. Uh, Wait, you're and saying that 10 to 50 percent of people go on to develop long COVID. Go on to develop long people. COVID. Yeah, a recent um, a meta-analysis looking at num- number of many studies in children who were thought to be pretty immune to, to long COVID found that 16 percent of children were still symptomatic three months later. So, um, so that's how I started. Um, and I've really, since then, I've spent almost 4,000 hours studying the biology of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, the pathophysiology of COVID-19. Um, after several months had gone by, I started looking at the interactions with the gut microbiome. There were a lot of speculation about this, but no data earlier in the pandemic. By the end of 2020, there was actual data. So I put something together on that. And um, there was so much information. It was so overwhelming that I realized the only way I could I could really organize it and understand it was to write it and to try and teach it to other people. So in February I, of 2020, I started posting a document on my website called, I, I don't remember what I called it in those days, but it had several, I, I kept uh, amending it as time went on. Mm-hmm. About a year into the pandemic, I realized that the biggest challenge was going to be long COVID. It was, it was obvious by the spring of 2020 that there were people who did not recover, who had, and that many people had ongoing inflammation that lasted for a long time after the acute infection. Um, and so going back to the spring, I guess the spring of 2021 really started to focus on the problems of long COVID and the research that was coming out. And there's been a load of research. By January of 2022, I had come up with a graphic image. Now I put this image together to help me understand what I was learning, but it is, I think, a very useful teaching tool um, to explain to both um, patients and to health professionals the intricacies of what goes on with long COVID. And um, because it's certainly not simple, but I think one of the most harmful things in the public communication about it has been this idea that comes out, oh, this is a mysterious illness. We don't know what's causing it. And I mean, people are really panicked about it. And, And that's not really true, actually. We know a lot about what goes into causing long COVID about the mechanisms, the physiology. Um, It just happens to be very complicated. Um, But but that doesn't mean it's not actionable. And and my perspective really from the beginning was, how do I find things that are accessible to my patients that will take away this fear that there's this monster looming over me that, um, you know, that's like a tsunami. Um, and mysterious and, too. Like that's one thing I was going to yeah. There's this myth that I was perfectly healthy and now I'm a mess. Like I have no energy anymore. Like that's not really, that is a myth because there it's very clear all the different things that are going on and you're, web your your illustration that you created is is perfect for if somebody wants to go quickly to the website doc drgallon.com you can actually see this illustration and you'll see all the different things that are going on but i would love to uh break down you know i so you mentioned the ace2 receptor and, and you also mentioned mentioned the gut so i'd like to get into both of those but could we start with the ace2 first because i had no idea when they first started talking about how the virus enters the cell through ace2 which to me was a gene that caused high blood pressure and all and i thought well that's interesting it was from you i learned that um it that the virus damages this receptor and causes all kind of havoc because of that so can we tell people you know, what that damage is doing as, as it enters. and Sure. Yeah. In order to understand that, you kind of, you have to understand something about ACE2. And ACE2 basically is like the fire department. It, um, it is part of a system, a response system in the body called the renin-angiotensin system, 
we'll call it the RAS. And the RAS was first recognized, discovered, I don't know, 60 years ago, and it's an attack system. Um, it is a very strong system for attacking, uh, for responding to injury and infection. Uh, one of the big problems with it is it tends to be overactive, and when it's overactive, it causes high blood pressure. So among the most commonly prescribed drugs for reducing blood pressure are drugs that interfere with the activity of the RAS system. Well, about around the turn of this century, it was discovered that there is another part of this system that does the opposite of the attack part. It's the healing and restoration part. And that starts with this enzyme, ACE2, which then produces um, a couple of products that are peptides. They're called angiotensin 1-7 and angiotensin 1-9. The names aren't really important. Those activate certain receptors on cells, and they basically do the opposite of what the, the attack part of the, uh, of the RAS does. And they're really important for um, recovery from infection, for preventing scarring, for controlling the nervous system, for preventing blood clots, for preventing damage to blood vessels. One of the things that became very obvious early in the, in the pandemic was that this virus entered the body as if it were a respiratory infection, but it really, the damage really happened because of the way it attacked blood vessels and impacted blood flow. And there's been a lot of research on this and there's some controversy about it, but I, I've part of my, my own reading was to really go deeply into how this interacts with blood vessels and what the complications are. And, and I don't think there's any doubt that when, that this virus causes damage to blood vessels, dysfunction of this, of the blood vessels, and that this lasts for months, even in people who appear to be fully recovered and were healthy young adults to begin with. I mean, it's not just in old people. It's in, you know, really healthy, athletic young adults. Um, the virus is very dangerous that way. Now, um, the, there are steps that can be taken to allow the blood vessels to heal. I think they're very important. ACE2 plays a pivotal role in maintaining the health of blood vessels. And so, uh, a, an approach to preventing long COVID that and treating acute COVID and preventing long COVID that starts with restoration of ACE2, I think is really essential. Um, well, there so whole, where, where yeah. is ACE2? All over the body? It's, Just in certain yeah, organs? Well, it's not in all cells. Um, actually, there's a lot of ACE2 in the lining of your nose. It's one of the reasons why the nose is, a, is an entryway. Um, there's ACE2 in the lining of blood vessels, lower amounts, but it plays a vital role there. There's ACE2 in your nervous system. Uh, ACE2 exists in certain cells of the immune system, not all of them. Um, it, 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 there's ACE2 in the genitals. Um, there's ACE2 in the kidneys, plays a very important role in kidney function in the lungs. And, um, the brain? In the gastrointestinal tract. But not the brain. And, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The There's a too? definite. Oh, wow. Right. Now, the, the brain impact, the impact of COVID-19 on the brain and long COVID in the brain is pretty complicated. Part of it has to do with impaired blood flow. People who have had COVID-19, even if they have recovered or thought they've recovered, you can demonstrate eight months after the infection with sensitive testing that there's impairment in blood flow in the brain, in, in the way the blood vessels respond. It's just not normal. And- um, Well, how would someone and, test that? Well, these are laboratory tests. I mean, oh, okay. it's very hard. It's, it's very hard to do that in, an ordinary, in a clinical setting. So your average 
you know, practitioners are not even going to look. Oh, yeah, no, no. I mean, even specialists would have a really hard time identifying this. This requires some very sophisticated tests. Um, there's, there are abnormalities of blood flow to the lungs. It actually takes several months for basically healthy young people to recover from all of the physiologic abnormalities created by this virus. But how would that manifest in the brain, for example? Um, headaches? Uh, brain fog. Okay. Brain fog, cognitive dysfunction. And then how about in um, the lungs? Uh, shortness of breath. And, and one of the things, one of the things that, that is not uncommon is um, patients will call me because they say, I'm really short of breath since I have COVID. Well, I've seen a cardiologist. There's nothing wrong with my heart. I've seen a pulmonologist. There's nothing wrong with my lungs. Um, the problem most of the time is that there's an impairment of blood flow to the lungs. The lung tissue itself is pretty normal, but there's, there's kind of like this dead space in the lungs because you're ventilating areas that don't have adequate blood flow. And that, and so the, the goal there is to try and help new blood vessels form in the lungs. And in fact, a study that there was a study that was done that uh, recently, recently published that attempted to find markers of who, how can you tell if someone has long COVID or not? And they found two markers on blood tests that could identify, separate healthy people from people with long COVID with 96% accuracy. Which is pretty good. Yeah, and, very- and, and the, if, if you take those two markers, what they indicate is that the body is trying to build new blood vessels. So it's sort of, it's, you know, it's not the damage that you're seeing. It's the body's attempt to repair the damage, but it lets you know, you know, that there was a lot of damage here. You know, like you see, um, construction, you know, a dam crashes, uh, you know, breaks. Uh, you, a month later, you can tell that there was something here because there are all the trucks trying to repair the dam. You're not seeing the actual dam break. And so that is part of what's going on. Well, what are those COVID. two markers? Because hopefully a lot of practitioners will listen to this. Well, it, it's not so easy to. Is there blood uh, tests? I mean, it, you can't just, yeah, they're blood tests, but okay. you can't just order them. I mean, one is called angiopoietin 1. Mm. And, you know, a lot of these names sound pretty similar. <laughs> but yeah. but it's very different from angiotensin one, which is what's involved in raising blood pressure. But it's a good thing RAS. because your your body's repairing itself. Uh, probably it is. Angiopoietin one is actually very protective to blood vessels. The fact that it's high and it's very high in people with long COVID, it sort of this is um, an indication of how much how hard the body has to work to overcome the damage that occurred. And it doesn't, and and you don't have to be very sick in the first place to show this. And you um, do you have to the, be very sick, or don't have to be? You don't have to be very oh, sick. Wow. That's mm-hmm. that's the other thing. When you look at blood flow, there are these studies. Um, they, there there are many ways that researchers have looked at the smallest blood vessels, capillaries, um, in different parts of the body, using. Um, uh, video microscopy of the skin of the, uh, under the tongue, of you, where you can see the blood vessels, you can see the blood flow or mm. special techniques looking at retinal blood flow. Th- that is, these are surfaces. These are kind of internal surfaces that you can access. And there's a loss of capillaries. And, and the, and one of the things that's really concerning is, this capillaries are the smallest blood vessels and but they're the ones that are transferring the oxygen to your tissues they're at the end of the line that's where the delivery takes place and if you lose capillaries you lose the ability to transfer oxygen and to pick up waste now the loss of capillaries doesn't depend on how sick you were and it doesn't seem to improve over a period of two years spontaneously. So there's a lot of work that has to be done to help. I mean, there are millions of people um, around the world and even in the U.S. who 
are suffering from symptoms related to having COVID-19. Yeah, I've heard uh, there's as much as 300 million people. I mean, that's not even accurate. <laughs> you mean, well, the, the, it's going to vary from country to country. And there is an underestimation. In terms of people who are symptomatic, the present estimate that I saw was um, something like 6% of the adult population in the U.S. Well, you know, that's... Um, it doesn't you know, sound like much. 18 million people. I mean, wow. You know, okay. well, you know, so, that's a lot. So and, the, and, if you're trying to, you know, heal this, is the answer to get oxygen into, these, oxygen, into the body, uh, into these organs? There are some studies showing that hyperbaric oxygen is helpful. Although I've seen some people who actually got sicker from hyperbaric oxygen. See, because the real problem is not the lack of oxygen coming into the body. It's not the lungs themselves. It's the ability to, to deliver oxygen to tissues. Um, it's, there is a, a fundamental disturbance of circulation. And, um, and then that's complicated. And that happens because of inflammation of the lining of blood vessels. That becomes complicated by the fact that blood clots form, microscopic clots in response to this inflammation of the lining of blood vessels. The microscopic clots then aggravate the inflammation, clog up the capillaries even further. And so you have to address those two problems. Uh, but in my web of long COVID, you know, there, there are eight spokes going out from the center and there, there are two things right in the center that are contributing to these eight spokes. So there's a lot of, there are a lot of things that that need to be addressed, understood and addressed. Um, and, and there is a, there's an effect of the gut, of gut, the gut and the gut microbiome. And, and one of the things, one of the reasons I like the web as a, a visual device is in a web, every strand is connected to every other strand. Uh, and that's the way it is in long COVID. Mm -hmm. Um, every part of it is connected to every other part. And there, and as far as the GI, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, so getting back to um, the need for oxygen, for example, uh, in the blood vessels and capillaries and all, can you, um, I know you've got a couple of supplements you have people go on uh, to, to work on that, but if you are focused on healing that, are you saying that other things will improve as well? Yes, that... It depends on the particular problem that you're looking at and how much damage to organs has occurred. Mm -hmm. So there are, there are layers of this illness and a lot depends on how soon after getting infected do you start taking corrective measures? Mm -hmm. How long have you been sick and how much actual damage has occurred? Also above and beyond the problem of people with symptoms, there are two other problems that I, th all, I think they all come from the same um, alteration of biology and physiology produced by the virus. Even among people who are not suffering from what's called long COVID, there is a, a significant increase in the risk of developing certain diseases during the year after COVID-19, heart attacks and strokes, high blood pressure, diabetes, um, and neurologic disorders, autoimmune disorders. There's, um, so there are changes occur that occur in the body that you may not be feeling, but that are there nonetheless. Uh, and then in some of the patients that I see, what they're left with after COVID is that some underlying problem that they had before they had COVID, maybe it was pretty mild, has become much worse. Mm -hmm. Well, um, so the thing is, um, I know I did an interview with Dr. David Minkoff down at uh, his center in Clearwater, and he um, said he tests everybody who comes in there late, you know, last year or so. Everyone tests to still have the spike protein. So is, if that so I'd like to go into viral persistence, starting with that particular one, the spike protein. But if there's viral persistence, isn't this going to go on and on and on indefinitely? I mean, 
Well, it may. So what it, the, what does it take to get rid of the spike protein? Well, yeah. first is trying to understand where is it? Uh, so th there's several issues related to this whole question of viral persistence. Is there a live active focus of infection in the body? There may be. Some studies have shown that if you, that there actually is live virus. The main place where the virus seems to hang out, live or not, is in the GI tract. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, that's something that you and I are both very interested in. So we'll should come around and, and discuss mm -hmm. the GI really implications. Yeah. Um, what most researchers believe is that for most people, the virus isn't live. It's just there are fragments there. Mm -hmm. There's viral proteins. There is viral RNA. And again, that is especially concentrated in the GI tract. And so while it's there doing these fragments even, is it mostly just causing constant ongoing inflammation? Yes. And mm -hmm. there was, so there was a, there was a study done, um, that took people who were getting colonoscopies because they had inflammatory bowel disease, but, but it was just a routine screen because their bowel problem was under control. And they compared the results of the, when they did the biopsies from the colon, because those are always done, they stained them to look for viral fragments or for virus. And they had three groups, people who had not had COVID, people who had COVID and appeared to have fully recovered, and people who had COVID and were symptomatic. And the people who had had COVID and were still symptomatic, they had viral fragments in the biopsies from their large intestine. And associated with those viral fragments was a hyperstimulation of the immune response, which would create inflammation. So that's definitely a significant part of what's happening. Um, and I can trace that process to a deficit of ACE2. But that's a, it's a very long, complicated discussion because oh. the body has mechanisms for getting rid of all this debris. I mean, this is, let's just say this is debris. This is what's left over. Mm -hmm. The body has mechanisms for getting rid of that debris. And one of the most important mechanisms is enhanced by ACE2. And what, what, if, could, you, could you explain what that means? Yeah, well, not... okay, it's, it involves cells called monocytes and macrophages mm -hmm. that, that um, circulate around, that live in tissues, that um, they're like the steam shovels. You know, they are in there. They, they're cells that gobble up things. They're, mm -hmm. And you need that gobbling up process in order to clear away the debris. You know, I have one study that shows that the spike fragments or the spike protein itself actually lives inside a ma the macrophages. Well, the mac part of the job of the macrophages is to get rid of it. And mm -hmm. what helps them do that is ACE2 or the products of ACE2. It's not the enzyme itself. It's the end products. And um, uh, so a lot of things come together. If you, if you look at ACE2 deficit as the central event that contributes to not all necessarily, but many of the adverse events that then create long COVID. So and, uh, basically yeah. then you're saying if you go back to treat the ACE2 with a spike protein or its fragments disappear, I mean, is that a way to mm -hmm. get rid of it? Well, that would be one way. Mm -hmm. uh, now, if you have live virus, so the, the protocol that I, put together that's, that I have on my website mm -hmm. is um, it's intended to help as many people as possible. So it's, it has several stages to it. And it, it's an attempt to allow people to personalize, you know, look at their symptoms, look at what's wrong and decide this is a way to go. But the first stage that I recommend for most people is to take some natural products that have antiviral activity. So let's kind of, let's, in the event that there's live virus, let's try to clean it up. Um, and then we will, I mean, that's not a forever process. That's a few weeks. Um, 
maybe four to six weeks. And then let's move on to dealing with the other problems that were generated by having this. Um, restoring ACE2 activity is kind of central and basic. Um, enhancing mitochondrial function, because the mitochondria are mm-hmm. damaged during the course of COVID-19. Um, and dealing with the, in, the inflammation of the blood vessels, that may be taken care of. The blood clots may need special treatments um, because they don't necessarily just go away on their own. The process that the body has for getting rid of clots uh, called fibrinolysis is impaired in COVID-19. So you may need help with that breakdown. And one of the things that I really like and have come to like more and more is an enzyme called natokinase, which comes from uh, soy, although the commercial pill form comes from a bacteria, Bacillus subtilis. And um, the, um, and what natokinase does is it has anti-clotting and anti-coagulant effects. It also happens to digest and break down the spike protein. Um, now, you oh, need yeah. fairly high doses, but a lot of people have benefited from the use of natokinase. And for how long? Um, as long as is needed. It's very mm-hmm. safe. Mm-hmm. Natokinase oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. is very safe. Just an enzyme. Well, and, um, so, so do you do these in a specific order? Like you first get rid of the virus, then you start focusing on the blood clots. Um, was there some other things you do for? I mean, the, yeah, the mitochondria well, is damaged, the gut is damaged. Uh, can, are you trying um, if, to like you have, address all of them? Specific, if you have specific symptoms that point to mitochondrial damage, mm-hmm. like fatigue, I would go right That's there. That's a big one. Coenzyme yeah. Q10 and other other forms of mitochondrial support. Yeah. So fatigue yeah. is honestly the number one complaint of everybody, and. Is it coming mm, just from the mitochondria the, or other things too? No, no, it's the fatigue. It's kind of a toss up between fatigue and brain fog. Um, mm. The most difficult problem to deal with, and, and, and it depends on how sick people are, because the people that, can, that, come, that are consulting me are people who have already been sick for a while and they haven't been able to get any help. So they represent a, a group that I think has significant damage, and it usually involves the nervous system. Um, that is probably, if we had to choose an organ that is damaged specifically at the organ level, I would say it's the brain. And, um, I mean, you know, there was a study. And so, but in order to restore brain function, you have to improve blood flow to the brain because that's part of what goes on. But, but there, there are other steps that need to be taken and some of them involve the gut. So the way that I, the way I approach it with an individual patient is going to depend on a lot of individual aspects of their history and treatments they've already had. The way that I lay it out on my website in the document, Long COVID Prevention and Treatment, it's about 50 pages long, is um, start with ACE2 and mitochondrial function, especially for fatigue and brain fog, because mitochondria are important in the brain. And then let's go to the gut, uh, because the gut has a major influence on long COVID. And it starts with ACE2, actually, because in the GI tract, ACE2 is not only present, it has a special role. Um, it, and it acts to, um, as a chaperone, which is a biological term, for the transport of amino acids into the body. So when you get ACE2 damage, you have to, you are going to, you're going to have trouble absorbing tryptophan in particular. That is the one that is the most sensitive, has the greatest need for ACE2 
in its absorption. That begins to change. If you're not absorbing tryptophan, tryptophan well, um, then that's going to impact the immune system in the gut. And there are certain immune response factors that protect you and that regulate the microbiome that fail. And so even if you started out with a really healthy gut to begin with, you're at risk of dysbiosis, of imbalances in the gut bacteria as a result of getting this infection. And, and, and leaky gut, because right, that leaky imbalance in these that. bad bacteria now that are present uh, with their lipopolysaccharides start creating the leaky gut too. So you're getting right. that. And, and then things are moving into the body and that aren't supposed people to be there. But, with long, exactly. Oh. People with long COVID have an increase in blood of something called zonulin. That is a marker and a cause of increase of leaky gut. Um, and it's, and it's especially true. I mean, one of the most tragic and feared complications of COVID is in kids is this, a condition called, um, MIS C, multi-system inflammatory yeah. syndrome of, mm -hmm. syndrome of children. And, um, and those kids have a very leaky gut and they have persistence of viral protein in the gut. And, and if you add a treatment for leaky gut to the conventional treatments, they do better. So, so they as a result, should definitely not be on wheat, uh, hmm. creating a big issue with Sonia. But I just want to, so in the gut, the ACE, um, the, Spike protein, there's ACE2 receptors in the small intestine and in the large intestine, and they become damaged. So when the food is down in the small intestine, you're saying that the amino acids are not absorbed properly. That's is, correct. That, that's like the... Yes, yeah, certain amino acids, especially tryptophan. And tryptophan goes down a pathway to create serotonin and eventually melatonin. So is sleep... Mm -hmm. And, and, and it also has another, there's another pathway that it goes down called the kynurenin pathway, mm -hmm. very complicated pathway and very susceptible to just to the effects of pollution, for example. And the brain, um, the quinolinic glass. And, right, right, and, right. Right. Yeah, I mean, it exists in the brain. It exists in the GI tract uh, and it, it may be, it may be anti-inflammatory or it may be immune suppressive. It may turn, it may protect your nervous system or it may be neurotoxic. You mentioned mm -hmm. quinolinic acid. So there, there, um, there, there's a lot of very, um, important biochemical pathways that are impacted by tryptophan and by the way inflammation changes tryptophan metabolism. So it's really a perfect, what you're, People are probably probably trying to see now that when you said that the web is interconnected, you're starting to really build a good case for that, or I'm seeing it anyway, that, wow, this is affecting this, this is affecting that, this is yeah, affecting the brain, uh, this is affecting the gut. Uh, yeah, inflammation. Absolutely. So the inflammation, though, um, I, to me, I'm thinking we've got these, you know, the spike protein persisting, or at least the fragments, and then... One of the things that the, it's pretty clear that happens is the um, DNA viruses like herpes, uh, Epstein-Barr, and so on are activated. Yeast is reactivated uh, in the gut, and then um, some other strains of yeast come along, uh, fungus, and all come along in the gut. All this is happening down in the gut, but um, so that seems like that's a major cause of the inflammation. Is oh, the it's definitely it's a major yes, it's a major factor. Mm -hmm. Um, and the, the reactivation of DNA viruses mm -hmm. that occurs in a significant percentage of patients. The reason it occurs, I believe is because there's damage to T lymphocytes and because, I mean, everybody in the world gets infected with Epstein-Barr virus, for example, mm -hmm. and 80% yeah. of people with with herpes virus, other types of herpes viruses. Mm -hmm. um, these viruses, we take EBV. EBV lives in your B lymphocytes and it just stays in a latent form. You have it for life. By the age of 30, 98% of people 
have gotten it. And um, maybe 10 or 15% of people who get acute COVID-19, they can actually demonstrate this reactivation. What is keeping the herpes, the, the EBV, in its latent state where it's inactive, it's kind of hibernating, is our group of T, T lymphocytes that recognize this virus. They're called T effector memory cells. They know who this, they know who this, this guy is and they know how to keep him, keep him in jail, basically. Um, when they are not working properly, then the EBV gets more active. And, um, and then the antibodies go up. They're kind of like the backup to the T lymphocytes. And there was a fascinating set of studies done about 40 years ago among medical students at Ohio State University that tracked antibodies and, um, T cell responses or what's, what's called cell mediated responses. They didn't have the same sophisticated technology then that we have now. Um, during the school year, in medical students looking at Epstein-Barr virus. And what they found was that at the end of final exams, the cell mediated, the T cell immunity was kind of weak and the antibody levels were high. At the end of summer vacation, it was the opposite. The antibodies had dropped and the cell mediated immunity were high. So just because there's been reactivation of one of these DNA viruses, doesn't mean that, oh, that's what we have to do is attack this virus. You know, sometimes people benefit from those treatments. Most of the time I have found that what really benefits people is strengthening their T lymphocytes. Hmm. Now, well, I want to of- ask you how you do that, but I have found that diet's really critical That because um, for years I've talked about, you know, the virus is like a dragon living in its cave and it comes out you know, when you're under stress, when you become too acidic, when you're eating, the diet's too acidic, then the dragon comes out creating inflammation, breathing fire and all. But if you get your body, keep the body alkaline, you know, with even something like apple cider vinegar, um, you know, quickly doing that as soon as you suspect that the uh, virus is coming out, like you're starting to feel you're having a herpes reaction, that really um, is something that can be done. But this, what you're talking about is more complicated. So can you explain? Well, actually, that? from the perspective of strengthening these mm-hmm. particular lymphocytes, um, nothing's quite as good as fermented foods. Um, and I mean, there are I'm actual studies in humans <laughs> showing that consumption of fermented foods stimulates the activity of these T effector memory lymphocytes, which are also important in fighting cancer. Oh yeah. Well, um, so so you're not too worried about the viral persistence, the herpes oh, coming out, the, the I, CMV, the Epstein Barr. I have not really been impressed with the importance of the viral reactivation. Mm-hmm. I do think I think persistence of the SARS CoV two, whether it's live virus or dead virus and just fragments, it plays a major role. Uh, studies that have looked at that um, in a systematic fashion have all pretty much concluded that, yeah, this is important. And most of them have reached the conclusion that that the virus may not be live. Although, you know, I always like to hedge my bets and not assume that this virus is necessary. You know, it's like in the movies. What, you talked about a dragon. The hero goes in and there's a dragon that might be dead. Well, most of the time, when you turn around the other way, that dragon's going to wake up <laughs> if you're in a movie. So I, I like to <laughs> I like to be cautious there. Well, the um, I'm always digging in myself. I found um, I found out that the reason that these viruses are persistent when they stay in their cave, for example, <clears throat> is because they have genes that make these proteins that keep them hidden from the immune system. They kind of it's like they're supposed to, the, the virus is supposed to come in and be seen and then transported over to the T cells where they kill it. But this gene, you know, secretes these proteins that hide the virus from. And I always thought that was interesting because until I started stumbling upon this, you know, I, I wondered why they are persistent. Why does herpes stay in our body? Why does, you know, Epstein Barr stay in our body? So it's kind of one of the things I'm loving about the COVID and the long haulers is that. 
it is a bad thing, but we are just, all this information is coming out. And for people to, that can connect the dots like you have, and then teach it or having a website and your, your web and everything, it's really just like it, in the end of all this, and it's an extraordinary, extraordinary time for really an, us to understand viruses. Well, um, the response to COVID, to long COVID and COVID-19 has opened up areas of, ex of understanding. It, it has so far to go. I, you know, I mean, the government has spent a billion dollars on long COVID research with very little to show for it. A lot of data, but not um, actions. Well, you seem to have them. I'm surprised you said well, that. Well, I'm, I'm talking about what's come out of the data, what's accepted, what people are able to get. Um, yeah, I'm constantly, basically, I, I try to be, a, I'm a problem solver. Mm -hmm. um, like really a detective. So I, you always have I been. I try to identify, basically. yeah, I mean, what I've been doing for about 40 years is, is working with patients who have complex disorders that haven't responded to conventional treatment approaches and trying to figure out what are the, how can we approach this, especially in, uh, in a way that is not going to create more problems than it solves. Um, and that's one of the things that I love about nutritional medicine. You know, you use a drug, drugs, and I, I mean, I do use a lot of drugs. I write prescriptions. Um, but most of the drugs that are used in medicine are biological straitjackets. They are designed to take some function of cells that has gotten out of control and put it under control. Well, you know, it's hard to get a perfect balance there because these functions, these are, these functions are important. It's not as if, oh, let's just get rid of this function. I mean, it's there for a reason. So most of the side effects of drugs are the result of what the drug is supposed to be doing. They're not accidental side effects. They're due to the fact that the drug does what it's supposed to do in a kind of indiscriminate way. Um, so like if you give somebody a drug for arthritis, but they also have an ulcer, the ulcer might get worse and their blood pressure might go up. Um, but if you can deal with someone's arthritis through diet, there's a good chance that their ulcer will heal and their blood pressure will come down at the same time. Um, it's just it's just a different way of trying to actually restore balance in the body. It doesn't always work. There's some people that are that are too sick for that, or they're, you know, we just don't have the tools at this time. But I'm I'm always looking for them because there is a huge amount of scientific information uh, related to um, alternative strategies for healing specific biological functions that have gotten screwed up. Um, you know, you mentioned the word autoimmune. I've been wondering about this for a long time because if we have these persistent viruses in our body um, and somebody goes, you know, has something wrong and they go to the doctor and they say, well, you have an autoimmune condition and we're going to put you on this drug to suppress your immune system because it's overactive. Don't you think it's overactive because of these uh, viruses and toxins, other toxins, even the gut bacteria creating toxins? So, you know, I, I'm just questioning the whole, the whole concept. But I know years ago when the first doctors started talking about autoimmunity, the you know, the thinking at that time is that's ridiculous. The immune system would not be attacking self. Uh, so, I mean, I'm a confused on the autoimmune concept. Yeah, yeah. Really. well, well, m most doctors are confused on it. There's a general confusion about it. First of all, auto autoimmune reactions are not necessarily bad, and they're not necessarily a sign of disease. There are certain antibodies that are created in your body in response to normal tissues. They're called natural antibodies. They actually are protective. And there's one study that came out recently that showed that there was a deficit of natural antibodies of certain types 
in people with long COVID. And it was kind of interesting because they took people, they took healthy controls. They took people who had chronic fatigue syndrome and they took people who had long COVID and chronic fatigue syndrome as the manifestation of long COVID. And it was only the long COVID CFS group that had the deficit of these natural antibodies. Um, and so, and those antibodies are actually, they are autoantibodies. That is, they are stimulated by um, components of your own cells, but they're actually protective. They recognize patterns in your cells that are also present in, uh, in bacteria and viruses. And so there's sort of there all the time ready to identify those antigens when they're in the wrong place. You know, so, you so say, that, oh, go ahead. Yeah. So I was going to say that's an example of how autoantibodies actually can be protective. There are a lot of people who have autoantibodies or manifestations of autoimmunity in their blood who are not sick with it. And there are certain autoantibodies in COVID, for example, that actually decrease inflammation and help recovery. So there's a, there's a lot of judgment that needs to be made about when is what we're calling autoimmunity really a disease? Mm -hmm. And when is it just part of, um, of natural processes that are decreasing inflammation and protecting ourselves? Now, but, but the doctor that yeah. says put somebody on an immune suppressant is wouldn't I mean, wouldn't you agree that the best thing to do is find out why these autoimmune symptoms are occurring? Uh, and, you know, just sort of they're, they're, they're looking at the shallow symptoms. Sure. They're not Absolutely. digging down to why. And, and, and the main driver of autoimmunity in general is damage to your own cells, cell damage. By toxins, then, by viruses, by whatever, by mm -hmm. an infection. Um, what toxins can do is they can they can interfere with the protective responses that help to turn off inflammatory signals. And and these toxins may be in food. They may be you may inhale them. Uh, they're in the environment. It's one of the reasons I think why human beings are not the same as laboratory animals. I, I mean, we're out here, you know, lab animals are in a very controlled environment. Humans are out here being exposed to uh, air pollution, um, to each food other. pollution, to <laughs> each other. Yeah. Um, so it, you, can, you, can, you can sometimes get a finding in a laboratory animal. You look for that same finding in a human. It's exactly the opposite. Mm, wow. And I think it has to do not 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 just with the fact that humans are not rats. Some humans are. <laughs> well, you know, but, uh, I, I've used the term for a long time uh, called, uh, I would say, let's strengthen your immune system. And I heard you say not to do that, not to strengthen the immune system. So can you explain, you know, oh, oh, why well, we make that statement? Yeah. Well, it depends on what you mean by strengthen. It's mm -hmm. the immune system. Uh, it's all about balance, really. And the immune system is not like a radio. That is, it doesn't have a volume. It's not controlled just by volume, you know, louder, softer. It is like an orchestra, the orchestra itself, not what you hear on the radio. You know, there are different sections of it, and they, and each section has to be integrated with every other section for a successful resolution. Um, the, they're basically five functions of the immune system. There's patrol, attack, repair, resolve, and remember. I mean, those are the five functions. Wait, and control? Patrol. Patrol. Oh, like, patrol. You know, like you're looking out there. around. Surveillance. For, yeah, yeah. yeah surveillance. Looking Good. around for trouble. Okay. Um, attack. You see the trouble, you attack it. Repair. You know, there's damage from this war. So you've got to repair it. Repairing does not get you back to normal. Repair. So beyond repair, there is a step called resolve. Resolve. And that very much is influenced by ACE2, by the way. 
Resolve is what it takes to get you back to normal. But then you have to remember. And in fact, the immune system, all aspects of it do have that memory. There's some at one aspect of the immune system called the adaptive immune system is a very specific, long lived and sharp memory um, for specific pathogens. But there is, aside from that, there is an immune memory that occurs that's much more general maybe not as long lived, which is, oh, we just went through a war here. We better be prepared for the next one. Um, and so you don't just get back to where you were before, you get back to where you were before, but with more surveillance and, and a greater readiness to respond mm. if needed again. So those are the, those are the functions of the immune system. And Autoantibodies and other things that we call autoimmunity, they work into it at different levels in different ways. Well, you know, um, well, as you said in the beginning, this is an extremely complicated topic. And I'm sure people, as they're listening, there's more questions constantly popping up and popping up. And they're wanting to know, most of all, how to treat the different, the microbiome, the ACE2 receptor, uh, which keeps popping up all the time. Um, but I would love to, I mean, is there a few things you want to, I guess everybody should just go to your website, drgallon.com. Look at the coronavirus guidebook, which is so interesting to me because you keep, you know, adding to it, which is fascinating. I, I wish in a way you'd put a book out that I would like to read it, but um, I know. Well, you know, a couple of years ago, that. a publisher had approached me about that and I thought, okay, yeah, I'll do it. I, I mean, I, I want to make this written. information out there for free. But then, you know, they wanted to, I wanted to focus on COVID mm -hmm. and they wanted a general book about immunity. And I, no, I, I don't want to do any more of those books. I, I've mm -hmm. done them. I've, I've written books. They're great, yeah. but yeah. I don't want to do a book because somebody tells me, Oh, this is what we'd like a book on. I want to do about a book that is totally about what I think is important and really mm -hmm. focused which is one of the reasons I just have been putting the information up on my website. So it's and, DR Gallon, everybody, and it's right there, the coronavirus website. The web is all right there. So I hope that most of all people realize how it, how, just what information you have is amazing and can help people. I, I was um, kind of wondering that because you, I know the ACE2 receptor is in the testes and in the ovaries, and I'm wondering... Um, you know, as far as the future goes, do you think that this virus is going to have an impact on generations to come? And also, do you think we're going to be dealing with more COVIDs in the future? And then what would you say to people if we are? Can they be prepared, you know, to deal with it better? Okay. Um, <laughs> there are okay. a lot of things right. out that's, there. <laughs> Sorry. That's a lot. Um, COVID is going to be around for a long time. And the full impact of COVID on our species, I don't think it, I think it's going to be a long time before we know what that is. Um, I mean, I would love it if this thing just went away. You know, okay, it was here, it was bad, it's gone, and, and we're and we're just moving on. Right, yeah, uh, I'm afraid that that may not happen. Why? Because this. I know people who are getting COVID-19 three or four times a year. Mm -hmm. This is, this is not like the flu. You know, this, uh, this is not a seasonal virus. And there are these changes in the body that continue for a long time after COVID that you can measure in some people, even those who seem to be fully recovered. I'm, I'm really concerned about, about that. And so I, uh, that's why I, I try to follow people very closely and, and make sure that they return to being biologically as healthy as they were before they got COVID. The, um, there will definitely be more pandemics. Um, in the, in and, the past, like the, the Ebola virus epidemic, the, 
flu of 1918, did they have this persistence that went on for generations? Well, you know, viruses can incorporate into our DNA, and that's something else I've wondered. Is it possible that the spike protein or its fragments can get incorporated into our DNA? Yeah, about uh, 12% of human DNA, something around there, is the result of viruses. It's really viral DNA. So um, there are enzymes that some of these viruses bring into our cells that make it possible for RNA to be translated into human DNA and incorporated into it. Uh, and the spike protein itself is toxic. That is, it damages blood vessels, it damages mitochondria, independently of whether you have a live virus. Yeah, so that's a real concern. Um, again, we don't, we're, it's going to be a while before we know what, where this settles. Um, there definitely will be other pandemics. And, um, I don't, I tend, I don't feel that we le really learned enough from this one oh, to yeah. respond po pro properly to the next one. Well, oh, that's, that's a good thing that you said that. I would think, um, everything you're telling us to do and you say on the website would prepare you at least to get a better result. But it's kind of depressing what you said, that we could go through this again. Well, we could be dealing with it for a really long time. We may not be able to, you know, be prepared to, to you know, have a strong resistance to it when it comes. But um, I just think what you're putting out in the world is, I mean, I know you said we don't know enough, and I would agree with that, but I would say that what you've dug up and put out into the world is amazing. So I want to I want to thank you for that, and everybody should thank you for that. And they won't be able to until they go to the website and look at the coronavirus book, um, guidebook. But um, one thing I did want to say, so a lot of long haulers are coming to functional medicine practitioners, and they're not really qualified to help. They're puzzled, you know, too. So hopefully... Some of them will be, we can, this podcast will make their way to them and they'll, they'll go to learn from you. But the, um, a group of people, of people like Patrick Annaway and his group, they looked at, they created long haulers post viral recovery to start training practitioners so they can get up to date. I know you played a really major role in helping them, you know, structure that and decide what exactly what to address. So thank you for that too. But do you feel, um, I mean, practitioners are not able to help. So are people pretty much on their own? Well, well there are some practitioners who are able to help. Yeah, but I, not I, look, 300 I think, million people. Yeah, right, worth. right. I mean, you know, the, the, the problem is that there aren't enough doctors or other health practitioners thinking about this the right way. And that's not surprising, actually. You know, a, about a year ago, a patient of mine went to um, one of the places that was doing great research on long COVID. And um, uh, and he, what he basically was told is, well, you know, uh, we're doing this research here, but we're not using it to treat anybody. We're just treating symptoms. <laughs> and um, maybe they'll get beyond that. They've really had a, a tough time launching significant treatment studies. And, and, you know, part of it is medicine, the way that medicine is practiced and taught and conceptualized is that it's all about diseases. So the question is, what disease does this person have? And if they have X disease, then there's a treatment for that disease. In fact, if you, if you're dealing with insurance, you know, the treatment has to match the disease and all the lab tests have to line up with the disease. So it's really all about the disease. So then, you know, so a lot of um, mainstream authorities have been dealing with the concept of, well, what is long COVID? You know, like, and are there different types of long COVID? You know, it all becomes trying to fit it into the disease treatment model. Mm -hmm. I mean, I discovered a long time ago that that didn't work very well. I mean, maybe it worked well in an acute care setting. Um, you know, you're dealing with an emergency. What's the emergency? Let's deal with the emergency. But once you got past that, it, it really doesn't work very well because people are much more complicated 
than their diseases. And the illness that pe- that a person has may be very different from the disease that the doctor is making a diagnosis of. And, mm-hmm. and the treatments needed may be very different, um, which is why the approach that I've taken, which I would say is the way I've been approaching things for 40 years now, is to understand what is the abnormal physiology and biology that's occurring here and how can that be addressed and how relevant is that for the individual person that I'm seeing. So we know a lot about how COVID-19 changes the biology and the physiology of your body. You know that. that. (laughs) Not everybody does. Let's just say the scientific community as a whole has discovered a lot. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, it hasn't been put together in a coherent, comprehensive fashion. There are some groups that are starting to do that. Um, but, um, but it's, but it's, it's, it's way, we're way behind on it. Well, with the I mean, post viral recovery, always outrunning them. Yeah. Uh, the post viral recovery, pro- it's very simple. And I know that's what they're trying to do is they're trying to simplify it, make it doable. But when I look at it, um, I think, gosh, there's more, so much more to address than, than they seem to be addressing. But I don't know because I, I haven't. You know, it's a heard. start. What, what I really, what I think that um, uh, Patrick Hannaway and his colleagues have done that is really that I, I feel, felt very good about is they tried to take something really complex mm-hmm. and make it simple enough that do- the doctors who were not specially trained. Mm-hmm. Can help, can do something with it. Yeah, that's. Um, what I and agree. I think the that's... I think the principles were were sound. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm I'm really looking forward to seeing the results of of uh, their studies. Well, they say they have you know they already have it in action and they're having good results already. So that's great. Mm-hmm. Well, th- first of all, people don't realize this, but it's late at night. So I want to say thank you for working all day long and then jumping on and having this conversation. Um, I think we covered everything. Um, Yeah, I think we did. We didn't cover everything, Donna, but we don't have time to cover it. (laughs) Well, I think we pinpointed the most important things to address. And now people are on their own to start digging in, going to your website, drgallon.com, and learning and then spread the word. I mean, I I just wanted to do this podcast because I think your work is the best out there and people need to know about it and they need to take it to their doctors if they have a doctor who cares Um, and, you know, realize that you you have answers that no one else seems to have. So I just want to thank you for doing that work, but also for being on tonight. Well, thank you for giving me the opportunity to share uh, what I've been doing. 